Thank you, Brother Brian. And yes, I have the questions here. I'm going to share my screen. And so you'll be able to see them one on one as we go by. So good afternoon, brethren. Thank you, Brother George, for that prayer. And thank you, Brother Bob, for your service. And this is a study on the beheading of John the Baptist. And it ties in really, really well with Brother Bob's thoughts. And uh, you'll see some of the pictures I have here on the screen, just in case anybody's wondering. These are pictures taken from the, the movie Jesus of Nazareth, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. And I watch it once a year. And of course, I only have time to watch it once a year because it's 246 hours long. So, but if you haven't seen it, it's worth seeing it. But that's where we got the pictures for uh, for this front line. So the convention theme is it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And some of the principles that Bob talked about and some of the comments during the break reflect during this study. And one thing that I will mention is that this is, in fact, a study. And so I really want everybody to feel absolutely free to participate with any questions any comments, any scriptures, any quotings of reprints or volumes, anything that you have that you want to share, we would absolutely love to hear it. And so there's five questions that we're going to attempt to cover in this next hour. And it's how does the convention theme fit into this story? How was Jesus frustrated with the Pharisees for not standing up to Herod? How does John the Baptist represent the church? Why did Herod not really want to kill John? And question five is, was it right for John to speak out in the manner that he did? Why or why not? And how should we behave as the church class in this day and age? So those are the five questions that we will cover. And let's go ahead and get started. We'll go to the first slide. And the first question that I will ask is, how does the convention theme apply to the story of John the Baptist's beheading? Can anyone think of any ways that the concept of a camel going through the eye of a needle ties into this story, why it happened, how it happened, and so forth? And we'll start by asking this question, what was it? Let's just remind ourselves of the basics. Can someone come off mute and tell me what Herod did that caught John's attention? And feel free to use, there we go, the hands. Andrea, go ahead. He married uh, Herodias. He did. And can you tell me a little bit about how he did that? Oh, I can't remember. I'm sorry. That's okay. Anybody remember this, his, the circumstances they were both in before he married her? Brother Jim. I think it was uh, Herod's brother, wasn't it, that had married her? And, mm -hmm. uh, and so then he takes her instead, uh, which is not uh, according to the law. Absolutely. So essentially... If we're thinking about this right, in fact, let's go to uh, let's go to Luke chapter three, and let's read that. And can I get a volunteer for someone to read Luke chapter three? And we're going to read just the first few verses. Let's read verses 1 and 2. Uh, Sandy Caturba, please go ahead. Sister Sandy, if you're, if you're reading, you're on mute right now. I'm so sorry, Brother Matt. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. 
So we see that um, Herod's brother, Philip, was also in a leadership position. Does anyone know what was different about Herod's position versus Philip's? Sister Sandy. Well, I have a note that says that Herodias was a granddaughter of Herod the Great. And first she married her uncle, Herod Philip. Um, Herod the Great also had another son named Philip who lived in Rome. And while a guest in their home, Herod Antipas persuaded Herodias to leave her husband for him. Marriage to one brother's wife while the brother was still living was forbidden by the Mosaic law. Does that help? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what we're looking for. Thank you. So they meet, they see each other. Um, at least she is already married. He might have been as married as well. And they just decide, let's ditch our spouses and let's get together. Sister Lisa. Uh, indeed, he was, he was already married with uh, a, a, prince, a daughter of uh, Aretas, an Arabian king of Petraea. So it was a double, a double problem. Oh. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, right? And so keep that in mind as to, you know, what persuaded them to marry each other and the circumstances they were in, because we're going to come back to that in a little bit in Matthew chapter five. And it, it, it might lead us to, to understand why Jesus gave us the specific instructions that he did. So that's what, that's what Herod did that caught John's attention. And so John uh, starts preaching against Herod's second marriage, and that we know. And so the next part of this question is, what did the Pharisees, what role did they play? What was, what was their position at this time? What did they do? And more importantly, maybe even, what were they supposed to do? Sister Sandy. Well, it was against the Mosaic law. So if they were um, the keepers of the law, um, it seems to me that they were required to do something about um, at least warning Herod against what he did. Um, I think that they didn't perform their job. Yeah. Can, can anybody tell, like, you know, again, they, they didn't speak up. They probably should have spoken up. What's the role of a Pharisee? Does anyone know? Sister Lisa. They were supposed to be the teachers of the law, and they were, they were supposed to also be uh, strict examples of upholding the law. And which they didn't. However, I think there's another thing that might enter into here because I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Herod was from uh, the, uh, what is it they call it? Edumia. So I'm not too sure whether even the Jews totally accepted him as being Jewish because I don't think it had changed. I think the law said that after 10 generations, he could be accepted as a Jew. But I might be mistaken here. Maybe someone else, maybe Brother Jim has more information. Over. Oh, thank you, Sister Lisa. Yeah, does anyone have a thought on that? My understanding is that Herod was supposed to be under the Jewish law, that the Romans oversaw Jerusalem, but then Israel themselves were broken up into four different sections, which is why they were called tetrarchs. Uh, Brother Jim, do you have any comments on that? Uh, as I recall reading in one place, uh, uh, Herod's father was an Edomite, and his mother was a Jew. So he Thanks was a Jew. It, it makes sense that he would have been under the Jewish law. Otherwise, you know, John the Baptist didn't go out preaching against anybody in, you know, Chaldea or, you know, Syria or anywhere else. This was specifically a Jewish law issue. Brother Austin. In addition to what's been said, uh, he was raised a Jew. All his mother was uh, Jewish. He was raised a Jew, so he was definitely under the law. Absolutely. So when we look at the Pharisees, let's ask the question, if they're the interpreters of the law, if they're supposed to be the experts in right and wrong, 
and they didn't speak out. and They didn't say anything. The question is why? Why would they not have spoken out against Herod? And this is where we keep in mind the question, how does this tie into, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Sister Andrea. Because I'm thinking perhaps they wanted to please men and not uh, to please God, which is the highest standard, which we should do first. But they wanted to uh, have the praises of men, so they didn't want to rock the boat, so to say. Over. I, I think you're absolutely right. Thank you for that. Um, I see, is it iPhone Joni? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm appreciating the comments thus far, and I'm, I'm just thinking that they were afraid of the consequences mm -hmm. if they did speak up. Over. Yeah, again, I, I think that, that that comment's spot on. Brother Austin, what are your thoughts? In addition to that, the you could... The reason why our Lord always reprimanded the scribes and the Pharisees, Pharisees made sure that they followed legal traditions as opposed to what was taught in the Bible. And that's where the variance is. They, what they ascribed in the Bible was not uh, was important for them rather than the traditions of their fathers. And therefore, if flesh is going to lead you, uh, the new creature is not going to uh, come in the way or reflect the lesson for us what, these things are given to us uh, not just for a story's sake what lessons can we draw and that's why your question is how does the convention theme apply to the story of John the Baptist beheading and that's where we're getting into slowly but surely over yes thank you brother Austin and uh, sister Andrea brought it up earlier too where it was more of a self gratification moment than a how do I serve the Lord moment Sister Joy. Yeah, so just like was brought up in the previous discourse, Matthew 23 shows how the religious leaders were camels. All the woes and all of the depth of, um, you know, straining at a knot, swallowing a camel. And you go through all the woes that Jesus pronounced. And it really does describe um, that character, at, but without most of them without the desire or any openness of mind to be led by the Lord in his transforming power. Um, so it was quite the situation. That, that was a really great thought, denying the transformative power of the Lord, you know, the rend us your hearts and not your garments concept. Thank you, Sister Joy. Brother Homer, what are your thoughts? So another possible reason is that it was a self-serving kind of thing. You remember that they were under the Roman domain. And of course, they had a certain degree of liberty in terms of religious matters. As long as they did not cause anything to rock the boat, they would stay in power. And of course, you know, if you have a disturbance and uh, uproar, then maybe Rome would have to clamp down upon them and they would lose some of their influence because you're supposed to keep things quiet and uh, you know live and let live. So that's another possibility. I think that's absolutely a possibility also. Thanks, Brother Homer. In fact, the way that we know that that's most likely somewhat true is if you go to the end of John chapter 12 and you'll read about the Pharisees talking about the resurrection of Lazarus. And that concept is exactly what they mention. We don't want Rome to come in and destroy us because in, in their eyes we're causing trouble. It's better for this man to die than for all of us to perish under Roman law, which, of course, is uh, kind of a wink from the Lord saying, no, they were right. It is better for just one man to die and save all of us. But they didn't know exactly how that applied. Thank you, Brother Homer. So, you, you know, some, uh, oh, we've got just a couple of other uh, screen's coming on. So, Brother Jim, what are your thoughts? Uh, just an additional complication on this, that uh, since the time of Hillel I, the first of the Pharisees, and his second in command, they argued as to whether uh, a man could divorce his wife for any reason other than adultery. Hillel said, absolutely not. 
Yeah, all right. No, Shemaiah, uh, the second in command, said absolutely not. And Hillel said uh, she, she can be divorced even if she only spoils the coffee. But they both agreed on one thing. Only the husband could initiate a divorce. Uh, Jesus was quite different in his teaching when he said, Matthew, or Mark 10, 12, and if she herself shall put away her husband and marry another, she committeth adultery. And uh, that appears to be what happened with uh, Herod's wife. Thanks, Brother Jim. And, you know, lots of detail in there. And I, I do have to agree. I also draw the line at spilling the coffee. I mean, absolutely. What an offense. That's just something I can't handle. So, uh, Brother Bernard, did you have any thoughts that you wanted to share? I saw your screen come on. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I was just uh, just replying back, you know, uh, how the uh, Pharisees um, reacted to uh, John the Baptist's accusation. It, I see it as a, it's not, it's a test. Remember, uh, in, De in Deuteronomy, Jehovah said, God chose the nation of Israel, not because you were better, but to prove of thee. And they knew, as you mentioned, they knew the, the law. They knew the, the Ten Commandments. So God provided that to show them that what they need to do. So it was also a test to show that their, their uh, faithfulness to God. Thank you. Over. Thank you, Brother Bernard. And since I have you right there, could I ask you to read something for us? We're going to uh, take a look at uh, some of the context and the order of events. And what I'm going to ask you to do is put yourself in the shoes of Jesus and think about why he says what he says to us. So, uh, Brother Bernard, if you could uh, look up for us Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Mm -hmm. And then Sister Joy Thompson, could you please look up Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. And Sister Sandy Katurba, could you please look up Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 31? And the question that I'm going to ask is, how do these three things tie together? Okay, I have the first one, Brother Carey. Yeah, go right ahead, Brother Bernard. Okay, uh, Matthew 4, 12, correct? Correct. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. So he hears that John is cast into prison. That's the only part that I want to hear. That's Matthew chapter 4. Now we're going into Matthew chapter 5. So pretty quickly after that. So Sister Joy, could you read for us uh, chapter 5, verse 20? For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So, Sister Joy, do you remember the context of Matthew 5 before that comment is made? I have to look. <laughs> Blessed are the... Peacemakers. Yeah, it's the Beatitudes, right? And so it's blessed, 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 blessed. And then we come to verses 19 and 20, where he says, all of a sudden, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you're not going to make it. Isn't it interesting how that transition is made? And now, Sister Sandy, if you could read for us that same chapter 5, verses 27 through 31. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into, says hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Do you think after reading these things and the, and the order in which they're read and the proximity of these events happening close together, is it possible that when Jesus is talking in Matthew 5, 27 and says, you know, before we even talk about, you know, the right ways to get divorced or not to get divorced, if you're looking at somebody else and you're starting to think, I'd rather be with that person, you've already committed adultery, do you think that might have anything to do with what Herod did 
And the fact that the Pharisees didn't say anything about it, and the fact that John was thrown in prison for saying something about it. Any thoughts there? Brother Julius. <clears throat> Brother Matt, what a, yes. what a challenging uh, discussion here. Uh, the, the contrast, the contrast between the, the, the incredible description of those born of woman that hath not risen one greater than John the Baptist, contrast him to the indictment of the Pharisees, the hypocrites. Why would, why would they be interested <laughs> in the morals? You know, they, were, they, they would exploit uh, to, the, to the max anything to, uh, to deceive, to, uh, to control. They were control freaks. Uh, uh, you know, uh, on the issue of silence, one more thing, uh, Brother Matt, brother, on the issue of silence. Uh, I recall like an interesting quotation by the late Dr. Martin Luther King. He said, uh, quote, silence is betrayal or Mm. That is powerful. Thank you, Brother Julius. I really love that quote. Silence is betrayal. Thank you, Thank you for that. You're Brother welcome. Homer, what are your thoughts? So we would suggest that, uh, you know, the religious leaders, they were legalists. And uh, of course, Jesus' ministry was one that uh, upset them. In fact, he had favor with the common individuals, the common man. But, you know, there came this matter about the law, the law, the law. And uh, even in another text, he spoke about, uh, you know, that Moses allowed, and Moses was the lawgiver. And so he allowed this opportunity. It was not that way from the beginning, going way back to God's principles, but he allowed uh, them to give a bill of divorcement, okay? And so... Uh, he says, but it was because of the hardness of your heart. Now he was, he was laying the groundwork for what would be acceptable to the Heavenly Father. And so uh, if you think about that, it tells us that absolutely um, the Lord Jesus Christ was preparing a cardinal uh, rule for those who are going to be spirit begotten. You cannot go and look solely at what happened in the past. Because God, you know, reminds me of, of another scripture about at the time of ignorance, God winked at that. Well, now we're which is transitional. We're going to another dispensation, the gospel age. No, no, can't do it. Thank you, Brother Homer. I, I again, I love that. I I'm a, a big fan of challenging some of the things that we do traditionally to ask, is this right or is it not right? It might be right, it might not be right. I think that the takeaway here is to Brother Austin's point, there's a big difference between somebody who serves the Lord with their heart, period, versus somebody who simply tries to interpret the law, whether or not they do it isn't as important, but their interpretation of it is certainly important. And then those who might even interpret it purposely to fit their own benefit. And so some of the answers that I had here on the next slide, uh, which I think all of you answered, and that is uh, that the Pharisees probably should have spoken out against Herod. If they're the interpreters of the law and they're seen as the religious leaders, they probably should have spoken up. Uh, did you notice that, you know, when you look through the scriptures, like the woman that came to clean Jesus's feet with her hair? They were quick to criticize her and call her a sinner, but they weren't willing to do it to Herod. And they were more interested in their positions of comfort and favor than standing up for God's laws. And so this is why I think in the second question here that Jesus was indeed upset with the Pharisees. And of course, we know that because we know the story already. But some of the, the reasons why are interesting. Does anyone have any comments or questions that they'd like to add to this portion?
for the Matin brethren, <clears throat> I believe, <clears throat> excuse me, I believe that uh, the church in the millennial age, in the, when the mediatorial reign begins, uh, hopefully we will be part of it and will be endowed with what I call uh, cognitive acuity. Uh, not, not cognitive, I mean, uh, uh, the ability uh, to read people's hearts. It's, it's an acuity that the Lord Jesus uh, uh, exemplified to the woman at the well. Remember when she lied to him? She said, uh, you know, she had, she had how, how many husbands, whatever. She lied to him and the Lord Jesus was able to read her what she was saying. So uh, there was a big plus in uh, our Lord's day when he was able to uh, recognize. In, I, I, oh, let me go back. Intuitive acuity. That's what I wanted. <laughs> it came to me. The intuitive acuity, the ability to read people's hearts. And our Lord Jesus here, evidently, it was he was right on target in uh, in uh, indicting these uh, hypocrites. Uh, weren't they lawyers? I think they wrote the law. I, I'm not sure. I think they were Pharisees were uh, lawyers anyway to begin with. So. Uh, that, that, uh, that's one, one thing that our Lord Jesus was able to do is to uh, practice the intuitive acuity and was able implicitly, without un unequivocally, without question, to read the hearts of people. What, what a, I believe the church will be endowed with that in the millennial age, over. Thank you, Brother Julius. I love that intelligent acuity. Uh, that's a really great phrase. And you know, that reminded me of the scripture where Jesus says, you are like white sepulchers on the outside. You know, you look great, right? But on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. He was able to read their heart. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thank scripture. you for that. Thank you. Brother Austin, what are your thoughts? Because of the Pharisees' um, greed and self-indulgence, their objective with Jesus was to trick him. They always try to trick him with the traditions and so on and so forth. And of course, we know what Jesus calls them. And, and he, in turn, our Lord, reverts it back by asking him a question, asking him quite difficult questions. And that's how Jesus responded. And that's why Jesus was upset with the Pharisees, because they're supposed to uphold, not just show, good, put up a good facade, and then have a double standard. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Brother Austin. You, you, you've got to, be, you've got to want to do the work that's involved in the position that you're in. That's for sure. All of us right now, we're applying for a kingdom job. It's the work that we have to love, not just the position or the title. Brother Lee, what are your thoughts? Brother Lee Hicks, I see your hand up, but if you're speaking, brother, you're on mute. Yeah, the uh, one of the things that I'm looking at is that the Pharisees knew the law, but however, they did not uh, apply it to themselves. So like in uh, Matthew 23, 3, you know, Jesus stated that all the things that they would do for the uh, uh, Jews, they should observe it and do it, but not as they did. They was hypocrites. They knew what was going on. They knew the marriage was wrong, but they did not intervene. Over. Absolutely. Thank you, Brother Lee. Yes, they that I think personally that that's what was going through Jesus's mind, that he's challenging their ability to execute kind of the office that they have. And again, I also look at it's interesting. They're willing to criticize those who are of the lower classes socially but they're not willing to criticize those who are of the higher classes. Thanks, Brother Lee. Sister Kathy, what's your thought? Well, brother, I think that it, uh, this has started 
long before um, Jesus' adult life, uh, when he is a child and the other Herod uh, wanted to put the, to death the children uh, to kill off the Messiah uh, at birth. And uh, it, it didn't change any. And our Lord kept saying, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees. And also with John, when they came to John, they didn't come to be baptized. They they came and he said, who has warned you to flee the wrath to come? And so he he um, rebuked them also. So there was no there was always hatred rather than love between between uh, for John or for our Lord. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Great thoughts. We're going to go to Brother Kenneth and then Brother Austin. And then we're going to move on to uh, question three. So, Brother Kenneth, go right ahead. Brother Kenneth, I apologize. You disappeared from my screen. I'm thinking that might be Sister Joan. Oh, okay. Yes, it is. Um, I've been through some experiences with a lot of people, and I don't think this has anything to do with it. I'm not sure. But sometimes we have to do it in a simple form. We can't do it um, and give it to somebody all in one setting. If you teach, I've taught school for 50 years, and I taught first grade, and you cannot give them an eighth grade book, inspect them to read. And so we should be awful careful of how we present the truth to people and give it to them piece by piece. And I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but I find I've had many people who have been very interested in scripture by doing it that way. So I think it's a promise or something we should try. Well, thank you, Sister Joan. You know, I think there's absolutely truth in that, that, you know, we need to kind of meet people where they are at. And um, so thank you for sharing that. Teaching school for 50 years, I'm sure you've got just more stories about how to do that well than, than you can count. Uh, Brother Austin, and then we're going to go to Sister Donna. <clears throat> the scribes, the, the Pharisees, exhibited themselves as righteous, okay, on account of being scrupulous keepers of the law. Instead, what did they do? And they were not righteous, but they masked their righteousness with hidden secret uh, in a world of ungodly thoughts and feelings. And so what is the lesson for us as when we are supposed to be followers of Christ, and if we say we follow in his footsteps, when we are with our brethren, when we are with at the conventions, is that one kind of standard? Or when we are with workers, uh, with our employees or fellow workers, or when we are driving, what kind of attitude do we, uh, uh, do we exhibit over? Oh, thank you, Brother Austin. Sister Donna, what are your thoughts? I was just going to sum up one and two, if I could give a thought, my brother, Matt. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I was saying that that what they showed, they were trying to serve man, trying to keep their position on being up and trying to serve man, where we are trying to serve the Lord. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees should have been trying to serve the law to be correctly. So for us as brethren, I think that we should watch and try to serve the Lord's law and give up what it is with man. Like some might be a doctor or a lawyer. Don't put all your all in that and try to be serving that instead of following the rules of the Lord's commandment. I hope I made my point. I hope I didn't confuse anybody, Brother Matt. That would be my comment. Thank you, Sister Donna. Well, I think that makes sense. All right, Brother Bernard, um, you can give our last comment. If you could keep it brief, that would be great. And can I also ask you, when you're done with your comment, could you read the section there on the screen that I've taken from the second volume to, uh, to get into our third question? 
Oh, yes, I could. I can be very brief, uh, Brother Matt. So what was going on was personality before principle. The Pharisees were putting their persons or personalities before the statutes and the morals of the law. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was that their stature was more important than the work that they were supposed to be doing. Okay, so you want to read, want me to read this part here, correct? Okay. Yeah, just real quick, let me uh, introduce this third question. This is, how does John the Baptist represent the church? I know in the, in the class studies that we've had, sometimes people have trouble really connecting the dots as to, you know, how does Elijah and John the Baptist and the church class, how did these things, you know, how were they joined together? So we're going to talk about that for a couple of minutes. So Brother Bernard, if you could read for us, that'd be great. This is from the second volume. Uh, between pages 260, 262. Question three, how does John the Baptist present the church? Volume two, page 261. As John decrees, his special work being accomplished when his message was delivered. So the church in the flesh must decrease. John the Baptist's closing experiences are still more clearly marked by the trouble feature. Though he was not obeyed by the people, Matthew 7, 12, they, for a short time, recognized him as a servant of prophet of God, John 5, 35. Yet, when he had announced the presence of Messiah, his influence soon began to wane. So as he had testified it, it would do, saying of Christ, he must increase, but I must decrease. So it must be in the end of this age, the work of John, the John class, the Elijah class, closes with the announcement that the kingdom of heaven is at hand and that the king is present. This is now being done in the exact words of Jesus' testimony apply with equal force at this time of the Lord's second advent. There standeth one among you, present, whom you know not, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge, cleanse his threshing floor, and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff, unquenchable fire, the great time of trouble. John 1, 26, Matthew 3, 12. Thanks, Brother Bernard. I appreciate that. Do you have any personal thoughts? Any could, could you sum that up yourself in a few short words? Um, well, I'll, I'll pass on that, Brother Matt. Okay, no problem. Uh, Brother George, I saw that you came off a mute. Did you have a thought you wanted to share? Let's see here. I see uh, Brother Noah Amu. And Brother Julius, Brother Noah, what are your thoughts? Oh, thank you, Brother uh, Matthew. So I think that, um, you know, in relation to the church and comparing the situation to, you know, this uh, current time of the gospel age, we realize that people's attitude generally towards religion is diminishing. Um, in comparison to how it, will, it was years back where people would, uh, you know, generally humble themselves to religious leaders and, and accept what they say, you know, appreciate God more. We don't see that. And so um, in relation to even witnessing activities, uh, people are called up to listening to the word of God uh, now or pay attention to them than they would have many years back. So in um, talking about John the Baptist decreasing so that the kingdom we are expecting, so the church decreasing so that the kingdom will increase, um, I think that has to do with the fact that our attitude towards the work of God has not changed. We still put in the same effort. We do our best to witness, you know, using technology one-on-one and, one -on -one and many other avenues we can. But still, the work is decreasing because that is what prophecy says. Because men's heart need to be prepared for the kingdom uh, when uh, you know um, the Christ, the Christ head and body, will be fully established to bless mankind. Um, you know, fully when everything is in the full sense. So I, I think that that in in that sense, we can compare that John the Baptist or uh, you know Elijah had to decrease. And the church is diminishing in that sense that our attitude hasn't changed, but our activities are not accepted um, in preparation of man's heart for the kingdom blessings. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Brother Noah. That was a fantastic answer. I really appreciate that. I think you're absolutely right. We're going to see our work diminish. And um, I like the comment, and I think you brought it out, where it said, you know, let's keep in mind that um, he was not obeyed by the people, that his message didn't work, right? And so we're seeing similar things today. All right, Brother Julius, what are your thoughts? <clears throat> Brother, appreciate, Brother Matt, appreciate the comments. Very, very uh, interesting, challenging uh, uh, subject here. Uh, my key point at this moment is that uh, John the Baptist did a, uh, a preparatory, a preparation work. That's what he prepared the way for the Lord. And uh, it seems to me that uh, Isaiah 52, I forget which verse now, says something uh, uh, about uh, uh, the proclaiming that our, your God reigneth. You know, the feet members, that would be their, uh, their uh, our, hopefully our uh, uh, mission to prepare, keep preparing the way for the Lord. And whatever uh, manner, method, you know, uh, uh, I, I love this conclusion to one of the one of my favorite poems, one of my favorite poems, and that is that for everything that God does, there is a reason and a season, a reason and a season for an ultimate conclusion. Now, this is a re remarkable person, John the Baptist. You know, think about it. He is not invited to be of the church class. You know, that's so, so interesting, you know. His work was done, cut off, cut off. His, his mission was over, cut off. So again, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> I reflect a little bit about um, um, Brother, uh, Brother uh, Goodman's talk is, you know, when we see the impossible, our Heavenly Father is there, is there to make it possible. <laughs> So, so yes, John the Baptist did a preparatory work, and I think there's a whole chapter uh, in the second volume. I forget the Eli Elisha or Elisha shall come first, something along that line, and I think it, it connects to that that we are in, in on the John Baptist class in that in that sense of doing a preparatory work, as it noted already noted in Isaiah 52, uh, proclaiming. That God reigneth, our Lord is present, brethren. He is preparing to finally bring an end to the long night of sin and death. Over. Thank you, Brother Julius. That's a great scripture. It was Isaiah 52 7. And that's the feet members announcing that your God reigns. And, uh, you know, to that point, we're going to bring up a very similar scripture spoken of differently, but it's going to help us in this study in Isaiah 40, not too far from where you quoted. So, Thank you very much for that. We're going to go to Brother Austin and then Sister Diane. <clears throat> Many followed John the Baptist <clears throat> and they came to hear him. It, in turn, what happened to him? He didn't let that make him become proud and self-focused. Nevertheless, he pointed the, his preaching towards repentance from sins. But bigger picture was he was pointing others to the Savior. If we want to be, become part of the church, the two qualities that John the Baptist exemplified is what is required. Now, one, he pleased God by being humble and obedient. Over. Yes, absolutely. And when you think about humble, he ate the locusts and the honey, and he was clothed with the bare minimum. He had no interest in doing things just to please others. Thank you for that, Brother Austin. Sister Diane, what are your thoughts? Well, my understanding of the uh, John the Baptist cl class is that it's not just the church. It's the feet members of the church that are present at the time of the Lord's return. And that started with the type of Elijah and his uh, being removed from the earthly scene in a whirlwind, the whirlwind representing trouble. Um, and then in Malachi, the fourth chapter, um, the fifth and the sixth verse says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And when um, John the Baptist was preaching, 
<clears throat> they, he was asked if he was Elijah because they knew of the scripture and they knew that someone would come that would, um, that would announce this great day of trouble. Uh, and of course, John the Baptist denied that, but he was indeed a type of Elijah, but he was also present in the flesh to herald the, uh, the Lord's first advent. And so the antitype of John the Baptist then, the greater picture, is those that are in the flesh to herald the return of the Lord. So that's how I understand how that Isaiah 52 scripture ties into the feet members of the church being responsible for announcing the return of the Lord in his second advent. Thank you, Sister Diane. That was fantastic. I absolutely think that you nailed it. And I'm going to share some scriptures here on the screen that kind of tie it together. I have to tell you, I love reading the volumes and what we just read from volume two, I really enjoy. And I think that once we read that, our job then is to, you know, again, remember that Brother Russell was the finger point to the scriptures. So go into the scriptures and see what they say and prove the point to ourselves so that it makes sense. And one of the points here, once you read volume two, page 261, and you see that uh, Brother Russell writes, that John represents the feet members of the church class, we then see this other scripture here. And I told Brother Julius that I'd quote a scripture close to what he quoted. He quoted Isaiah 52. And I'm taking a look here at Isaiah chapter 40, verses 2 and 3. And to Sister Diane's point, I want you to think specifically of the timing here. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So this has to do with the end of the Jewish double, uh, specifically the 1878 time frame. And then look at the description of those who are said to give this message. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And so we see that it's this feet members of the church class that are saying this to Jerusalem. And at the same time, they are described the same way as John the Baptist was described as the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. And so in my mind, that's a really good tie into how the church and John the Baptist are symbolically representing each other there. Brother Homer, what are your thoughts? So I'll just make one brief observation because, you know, in a certain sense, both John and Elijah represent the church. And I would like to suggest that uh, when you look at what actually happened, literally, uh, John died in prison. He was beheaded. Elijah was carried into the heavens. So even though they both represent the church, it's from different standpoints, probably, in terms of how uh, they're viewed. From one standpoint, uh, those, the beheading of John the Baptist, he was, you know, cut off and, you know, doesn't come to anything. His voice is still. That's how man would view it, because you got to, you know, shut him up. But on the other hand, Elijah was taken to heaven. Victory. So it's a very interesting kind of thing. And I would just say, you know, depending upon when you want to apply this, and I guess that's one of the reasons brethren like to study prophecy, to broad application, we may not be able to tie everything together as we would like. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Homer. And yes, I, I'll tell you, if it weren't for the scripture where where Jesus, somebody says to Jesus, I think it was the disciples say, shouldn't Elijah must first come? And then Jesus says, I tell you that Elijah has already come and they didn't listen to him. And then the comment afterwards is he was speaking of John the Baptist. You take that scripture out and it's kind of a difficult tie to tie Elijah to John the Baptist, but we're thankful for these scriptures that give us those little key points and indicators. Sister Kathy, what are your thoughts? Well, I have a question for you, brother. 
I yeah. would to say uh, um, the Lord speaks, and, and I'll try to paraphrase it. He speaks to his disciples, and he said that that uh, some of you here will not die until you see the kingdom come. And he takes them up six days later, Mount of Transfiguration. You see Moses on one side of Jesus, and you see Elijah on the other. Does Elijah represent the church in that picture of the kingdom? You know, Sister Kathy, that is an excellent question. And I always like to research my answers before I give them. So I will give this answer, which is, I don't know, but it sounds reasonable that it could. One of the ideas that I liked that's, um, I think, interesting is, you know, again, why were Moses and Elijah uh, pictured there? Why was it, of all the people that he could have seen, why was it those two people? And it says that in the conversation they were having, they were talking about his death. And it occurs to me that what two better people to talk about accepting the time of your death in advance knowingly than two people who did that very same thing, where God told Moses, you're not going to go into the promised land. You're going to pass away here on this side. And then with Elijah, he knew it was his time. He was taken up in the whirlwind. So they both knew the time of their death, and they accepted it. And that's the same thing that Jesus had in front of him, is that he knew he was coming to die, and maybe that was a part of that conversation. But again, I wasn't there, so I can't tell you for sure, but I really like your idea. Uh, Brother Lee Hicks, what's your idea? Uh, yes, I enjoy the comments. <clears throat> but one of the things that I'm looking at, is, uh, maybe I'm thinking about, that the as the beginning of the foot members, Elijah class, there was a certain number supposed to be uh, taken from all the nation of the world, that is. But this number decreases as we move through the, time, the stream of time. So this is a decreasing, you see. So maybe at the end, or close to the end, uh, during Jesus' presence, there won't be many that would be left in the flesh. Over. Thank you, Brother Lee. Yeah, again, that's a great point that, again, we see this decreasing, and that's absolutely a sign. Uh, just to wrap up this one slide here real quick, I'm going to do this very briefly, that I wanted to tie in not just the church and John the Baptist, but also church and Elijah, because, again, it's these three that are mentioned being kind of tied together. And with Elijah, we see here in James 5.16, that there was a three years and six month drought. We see here in Revelation 12, six and 11, three, that there's this three and a half years, this 1260 days, which again is three and a half years. And they're tied together that there would be, you know, a drought in the picture of Elijah and James, and that there is a lack of food. There's a lack of truth that the two witnesses clothed in sackcloth and sackcloth means you're in a state of mourning during this 1260 days, in which case the truth itself was suppressed. And so that's where Elijah and the church seem to have a direct correlation. We see that the church of John the Baptist seem to have a direct correlation. And so it all kind of ties in there together. So uh, we're going to wrap up here. We're going to skip question four and we're going to go to question five and only speak briefly for about one minute. And the question is, was it right for John to speak out in this manner? Why or why not? And most importantly, how should we behave when we see injustices today? And I would like to read just two sets of scriptures here to close us up. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5, Be obedient unto them that according to the flesh are your masters. Be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God to be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. And so even though we are commissioned to preach the word of God, the way that John did it, might not be the way that we do it today, where it's, you know, we get the impression that John was saying it very loudly, very vocally, 
Um, he referred to the Pharisees instantly as a brood of vipers when they came on the scene when he was baptizing people. And we're not supposed to have that level of angst in our discussions. And so finally, remember the fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there is no law. So we've got two hands to close out our study, Brother Noah and then Sister Donna, and then we will close and hand it back over to Brother Brian. Brother Noah, hey, go right ahead. You want me to go first, Brother? Uh, actually, since you're off your mute already, why don't you go ahead? I was saying that we should do it discreetly, not try to be rude or offend them. Is that where we said, be gentle, be kind. So don't, even though we see wrong, we should try to control to not to offend anyone while we're trying to correct. Do it as we should be harmless as doves. So do it with kindness and with love. John the Baptist was doing correctly, but he was kind of, well, he was beautiful with it. That'd be my comment, brother. Thank you, my sister. Brother Noah, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, and uh, quickly, I, I, I'm thinking of what goes, um, you know, Dick and Stephen into trouble, you know, being killed by Paul, and what actually also got Paul himself into many troubles, going into prison and all that, because they stood for what they believed was right. And um, even though we're not expected to get into politics and all that, um, what are the virtues of right uh, and and we should stand for the truth, I believe. And so if it's going to affect our beliefs and the truth, then we should speak against. But aside that, we could mind our own businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Noah. And I'm sorry, I'd like to take the more comments, but I'm going to hand it back over to Brother Brian. The last thing I'll say about John the Baptist that's really impressive, when you don't own anything in the world that's flashy or shiny, it sure is to give up everything you need to in the service of the Lord. So. Brother Brian, back to you. 